Welcome, every happy warrior. Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thanks for being part of the show, and thanks for all you do in promoting the show and telling people about the show. And um, I welcome not only all happy warriors, but all happy warriors of every age. And uh, few things give me more pleasure than when happy warriors have a baby, and particularly a baby who is going to be raised to be a happy warrior. That is going to be the cure. That is what is going to make everything okay. So congratulations, happy warriors, Lydia and Alex. Uh, They've welcomed a little happy warrior in training, a little baby boy. And uh, I appreciate you letting me know. I really do. It's, uh, it, it, it uplifts me and makes me happy to hear. It really does. So that's all very good. Uh, what's not so good is that um, I've discovered that some happy warriors are using a motivational device known as a vision board. And I want to discourage you from doing that. Let me tell you what a vision board is. It comes in various um, colors and sizes and shapes, but essentially a vision board is where you put up pictures of things you want to buy. And, um, you know, whatever it is, a new house, a car, a boat, uh, and these pictures... Um, are put up on your vision board, which you put somewhere where you're going to see every day, and you go along and you 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 sort of almost genuflect to it every day, and uh, you you say affirmations, and this is meant to propel you forwards. Number one, I don't believe it works. Number two, I think it may even be a handicap. Why would that be? Well, I'll tell you. Because the way that money really works is that naked and venal pursuit of money uh, seldom results in its acquisition. Look, uh, one of the best proofs is the entire high-tech revolution, where uh, every high-tech entrepreneur that I either talk to or read about or listen to, uh, almost all of them speak of the same thing, which is we weren't in it for the money. We wanted to change the world. We wanted to bring something new and fresh and different. Uh, The money followed secondarily. And what vision boards do is they reverse that. They make what you're going to get the most important thing of all. And that's why I am very suspicious that it actually turns out to be a handicap rather than a help, a hindrance and a harm rather than something that gets you closer to your goals. And so uh, uh, what should you be doing? Well, you should be focusing on benefiting other people, helping God's other children, doing things that uh, bring benefit to your fellow citizens, people in your community. The money follows by itself. Almost any action which reeks of self-interest and uh, and uh, personal gain uh, doesn't take you in the right direction. Right, it's uh, it's it's one of the reasons that the last chapter in the book "Thou Shall Prosper," I almost say your textbook, um, is never retire, and I explain what's wrong with the entire philosophy of retiring. <laughs> so, if you don't use a vision board, great, don't be tempted to put one up. Um, And if you do, consider taking it down for 60 days. And what should you be doing instead? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what your, here's what your vision board should really look like. It should have the following seven items on it. You're going to laugh, but but I don't want you to laugh at this. I want you to think about it very seriously, okay? Uh, It should have your profit and loss statement. You know what? 
there's one thing I have to tell you before I give you the seven things it should have. And that is something that I've uh, written about, something that if you are a happy warrior, you should already be very aware of this. And that is that no matter whether you're an employee, no matter whether you are a a consultant, whether you are a uh, whatever you are, you should be thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur. You should be thinking of yourself as owning your own business. Even if the business is doing nothing more at the moment than renting out your services, well, then you are at the moment the prime, maybe the only asset of the business. Your time is sold and your business receives payment for that. And obviously, uh, the old way of thinking about that was, you know, your pay, your paycheck, your salary check. But no, that is the revenue that your business and you could call it me incorporated your personal business has revenue from renting out your services your time your skills and thinking that way means that you are already even when you're asleep your mind is coming up with ideas to expand your business But if you're nothing but an employee, well, then you're just a wage slave. There's nothing to expand. There's nothing to build. It's subtle, but very important. And so therefore, instead of having a picture of your dream car or your dream boat or your dream house on your vision board, uh, what you really want to do is have the following seven sets of figures that you can look at. And, you know, you change your vision board, you know, every Friday, uh, you need a profit profit and loss statement. You need a balance sheet. Those are the two right up front. Then you should have a list of your receivables. And that is, you know, money owed to you, money you're expecting. Um, it might, you know, it, it, it could be uh, you've sold something on on online and you're waiting for the money to arrive whatever it is you list the receiver the money you're expecting to receive the fourth uh, item is a list of your payables a list of the bills that still have to be paid this month or this week depending on what period uh, you know how regularly you refresh your vision board Uh, you should also have your checkbook reconciliation and you should have any Um, I call them open purchase orders. But that means, you know, if you're planning on uh, buying something on Amazon, then write it down. If you're planning on buying a book, if you're planning on, uh, maybe you're planning on on buying my online financial prosperity course. Well, you need to write that down. That's a purchase order. And don't allow yourself to buy anything at all if the purchase order isn't up on your vision board. And then finally, the seventh is a cash flow statement. Now, I fully expect that some of you listening right now are scratching your heads and you're saying, um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I understood what he said about payables. I understood what he said about receivables, but I'm not sure I know what a balance sheet is. I'm not sure I know what a profit and loss statement is. Uh, I'm not sure I know how to do a cash flow statement. Well, okay, great. Uh, Step one in your move to a new financial destiny is to start learning how to do that. You know, nothing that you want to grow can ever be done if you have no way of measuring it, right? It's it's simple. Uh, If you want to uh, be able to, to run, then you need to time how long it takes you to run a certain distance. And then you can measure every week whether that time is dropping, whether the distance is increasing. But if you don't measure and record, you have no way of improving and you won't improve. You know, you want to lose weight. You, you've got to weigh yourself every day and write it down. Well, if you want to increase your revenue, and I want you to increase your revenue, because if you're increasing your revenue, it means you're doing more for me and for everyone else. So you need to learn how 
And this isn't hard, by the way. I mean, there, you can learn online. You can get a book from the library. Uh, the, you can buy the books. I mean, cheap, cheap, inexpensive books teaching you how to draw up a simple P&L, a simple profit and loss statement for you incorporated, or you might call it me incorporated or uh, Lappin incorporated or whatever your name you want to put on it. You want to be able to do a balance sheet. You want to do receivables and payables. You want to do checkbook reconciliation. You want purchase orders and you want your cash flow statement. Now, that is very different. Now, think about this for a moment. Why am I saying this is different from putting up a picture of the, your, you know, your dream car you want to buy or the dream mansion you want to be able to afford? Uh, why is that not a good idea? But putting up your seven main financial uh, guides, your da- financial dashboard is a good idea. Well, the difference is very real. And that is that if I put up uh, a picture of the Ferrari I want to buy, the, my dream car, well, all I'm thinking about is me. This, this is nothing but gratifying my own desires. I'm doing nothing for anybody else. I'm not thinking in those terms. But if I put up my financial dashboard, money is what? Money is proof of what you've done for other people. That's what you really are measuring. And so when you look at $100, you say, fantastic. You don't just say, I got $100. You say, I delivered much more than $100 worth of value to somebody else, because otherwise I wouldn't have got $100 from them. And so a financial statement actually records your effort. It records what you're doing, whereas the classical vision board does nothing but record your desires. Oh, I want, gimme, gimme, gimme. I want, I want, I want. I don't believe that that does anything positive whatsoever for your financial growth. I don't think so. And so um, that would be something very worthwhile doing. If, If you haven't done it yet, all you have to do is give up four hours a week of watching video. That's all you got to do and replace it with four hours a week of learning how financial records work, how double entry bookkeeping works. This is not hard. You just got to do it. That's all. Just do it. That's all. And the difference will be profound. So if you have a vision board, try getting rid of it for two months. Uh, If you don't, then uh, try and put up your financial statements, whether you change them, whether you update them once a week or once a month, doesn't matter. But looking at them every day, now that is useful and it's also a positive action. It's a good thing. Um, the, um, The financial prosperity collection is an online course. It's 10 hours of video teaching. And by the way, a Father's Day discount for listeners to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. You go to the website, rabbidaniellappin.com. You go to online courses. You find the Financial Prosperity Collection, and you purchase it. And uh, you, for your discount code, you type in FATHERS, then the number 20, 20, because it's $20 off the price. So that's very, very nice. Go ahead and uh, you can get hold of it. If you're a dad, go for it yourself. If you're not, well, maybe it'll help you move towards becoming one, right? I, I want to see more happy warriors. I want to hear about new little happy warriors. Um, I've got another nice little happy warrior in Las Vegas. He's, uh, he's about six months old now, something like that. So that is exciting. I love knowing about little happy warriors in training, little boys and little girls who are being raised with the credo of the happy warrior. Um, alcohol, interesting. It poses a huge problem for evolutionary theory. For those people who believe, I'm not going to say no, because there is no way to know this, but for people who believe that human beings are on this planet because of a lengthy 
process of unaided materialistic evolution that converted primitive protoplasm into plumbers and ballerinas, then they have a problem, which is why for thousands of years have people been drinking alcohol? I say for thousands of years because uh, we know that. Number one, uh, alcohol is mentioned in the Bible. After the flood, Noah got drunk, became intoxicated early in Genesis. So uh, we also know archaeological finds of um, uh, vats, vats used for uh, brewing beer. That what? Why? Why would if if we are really the product of evolution? And since nobody can say that alcohol is good for the body, it's <coughs> it's not as if those early human beings using <coughs> going with the evolutionary model those early human beings who developed a taste for alcohol, well, they had a selective breeding advantage. No, on the contrary. Right? They'd have made really bad decisions and uh, they would have been reckless and they would have done bad things. So no, alcohol would not have helped. So how come it's still around? You would have thought by now a taste for alcohol would have been bred out of human beings. And the, the old Latin monks really understood this very clearly because they made the latin word for alcohol spiritus and uh, to this very day you can go to stores in in different parts of the world and uh, there will be stores that sell alcohol and they will say on the door sometimes wines and spirits spiritus that's right why because they recognized that we don't drink alcohol in order to make our bodies healthier. You know, alcohol is not a recommended food supplement. Alcohol is not a special vitamin group. Right? We know we know it's not great for the body. But the reason that we use alcohol is for the spirit, for the soul. Meaning that when people take alcohol, and sometimes to excess, unfortunately, when people take alcohol you got to think about it. Are they doing it because their leg hurts? You, usually not. People taking alcohol because uh, uh, they got a headache? Usually not. People usually take alcohol because it eases existential pain. People who are, you know, you're overwhelmed with regret and remorse. You are uh, in danger of, or you have, you've, you've lost a love. You've lost something important. Uh, the pain can be alleviated by means of alcohol, right? It is entirely a response to spiritual pain, not physical pain. And that's why it is that um, Bill Wilson of Alcoholics Anonymous, in collaboration with the psychiatrist, not Sigmund Freud, the evil, but Carl Jung, the wise, and... Uh, uh, Wilson and, and Jung realized that this was entirely spiritual and that the 12 steps has to take into account the fact that there is a spiritual need, not a physical one. Well, of course, the uh, entire notion that human beings are on the planet by means of an evolutionary process, well, that has no room for spirituality. There is no such thing as a spiritual dimension to the human being. The human being is nothing more than about $10 worth of common chemicals, you know, put together in a certain way, different from the way those things are put together to make an oak tree, and different from the way those things are put together to make a goat. But, um, but nonetheless, the same basic ingredients, and that's all there is to it. There's not much else more than that to a person. And so uh, for those people, the entire uh, human relationship with alcohol is a massive conundrum. <laughs> it's a colossal problem. And uh, I enjoy, every now and then, I seek out various articles 
um, usually from some university press or another, where they try to explain from an evolutionary perspective how it is that human beings developed a fondness for alcohol. Well, very nice. But um, uh, no, it, it doesn't work. It simply does not work. So um, we have going on at the moment... Um, a revolution. Now, the uh, Russian revolution in the uh, second decade of the 20th century, the French revolution at the end of the 18th century, these were revolutions that happened fairly quickly. Uh, they happened with considerable violence, and they happened very quickly. But some revolutions take a lot longer. They don't happen that quickly. And right now, in many parts of the world, uh, not just in the United States, it's very notable in the United States, but it's also happening in Canada and it's happening in Australia, it's happening in Great Britain and many, many other countries with which I'm less familiar. And that is, it is astonishingly a revolutionary move towards socialism. And so I thought it might be helpful if we would spend a few minutes in today's show uh, getting a clearer understanding of how almost everything you read about in the papers, everything you see on the news, everything you hear about, uh, all pointing in the same direction. There is a coherent and carefully worked out worldview called socialism. How far back does it go? Does it go back earlier than 1917, the Russian Revolution? Yeah. Does it go back earlier than the French Revolution in the 1790s? Yeah, much earlier than that as well. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the best place to get a handle on it is the Bible. And again, I know that listening to this show are many people who regard the Bible as God's message to mankind— and there are many, many people who regard it as a, a collection of many different writings by bands of babbling Bedouins, and, um, and that it has absolutely no significance at all in the life of modern people. So I know we've got all kinds of people listening to the show, and I appreciate that, and I like that, and I love hearing from all these people, but... Um, uh, this particular information is direct from the Bible. As a matter of fact, it is the first nine verses of chapter 11 of Genesis. That's all. And um, I have on the website a program called De um, The Tower of Babel, Decoding the Secrets of of Babel. Actually, the name of the program is Tower of Power, pardon me, Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. Why I call it Tower of Power is because any worldview, any coherent worldview that explains who you are and your relationship with something bigger than you, that imparts enormous power. And so, if you are a member of a hard-driving, revolutionary, enthusiastic socialist group, you have far more power pro propelling you forward in life than somebody who's a member, shall we say, of a tennis club. Because right? a tennis club doesn't provide you with a coherent worldview that explains your relationship with something bigger than you. Uh, but even better than socialism, uh, stronger than socialism, is a belief in a biblical worldview, a biblical worldview. So powerful is that, that it actually created Western civilization, the civilization that people risk drowning in the Mediterranean to get to on rickety boats, the civilization to which people walk up to Central America and try and scale the southern border. Uh, the the uh, the steps that are taken by people desperate to leave parts of the Middle East and parts of Asia and make their way to France or Germany or Canada or North America uh, United States all of these these things show the power because this civilization 
to which they walk on their bare feet and in which they empty their wallets in order to get to Western civilization, uh, this Western civilization is a product of the Bible. Now, earlier podcast go back a little while if you're interested in that if you're uh, scratching your head and you're saying what on earth is he talking about that's impossible western civilization's got nothing to do yeah it's got a lot to do with the bible and um, i think you will find it quite persuasive you'll have to go back to an earlier podcast because i cannot repeat that now we have other important work to do for today if that's okay with you and so uh, I'm, I'm I, for a full story of how the nine verses at the beginning of chapter 11 of Genesis talking about the Tower of Babel, that's the full extent of the story of the Tower of Babel. Uh, if you need a full explanation of how each verse by verse takes us into the mind of socialism, uh, then just go to the website rabbidaniellappin.com and look for the program called Tower of Power, Decoding the Secrets of Babel. But for a very brief summary of that, I will tell you right now that verse 1 of chapter 11 says, the whole earth was one language and of one speech. Um, So, okay, so that's that's interesting because the, uh, the vision of socialism, as John Lennon sang in his song imagine the vision of socialism is no borders it is international Uh, workmen of the world unite the song is the international Uh, the idea is no borders at all no separate countries because that'll bring peace right so you get that being somewhat of the initial situation and um, then verse 2 tells us they journeyed from the east and I explain how a journey from the east, from the east, is always a journey away from God's biblical model of human cooperation called godly vision of society. They journeyed from the east. That's what that means. And um, then verse 3 says that they didn't want to use stone. They wanted to use brick. All right, well, What's the difference between stone and brick? Ancient Jewish wisdom emphasizes the importance of verse 3 by explaining that every stone is God-made. Every brick is man-made. Every stone is unique and different. Every brick is identical. And uh, that is a metaphor for people, the building blocks of society. Is society going to view us as individuals, each one made by God in his own image, different from one another? uniquely different or are we going to allow ourselves to be the bricks of society everyone the same living in government housing identical taking public transport to work in the same direction everybody traveling together are we going to be bricks or are we going to be stones that's the central challenge of these nine verses and uh, what is more, uh, which I'll come to a little more in a moment, but the Hebrew word for a stone in the Lord's language is father, son, father, son, father, son. That's what the word means. So a building block of stone, in other words, where people are going to be a part of society in a godly model. Not only are we each unique, not only are we each made by God, but we are each the product of a father-son relationship. You've got to have the father there. What happens to a society where fathers are absent? Do you need me to tell you what a calamity results? I don't think so. It's, It's so obvious and so clear. It's clear in the United Kingdom. It's clear in France. It's clear in America. It's clear in different inner cities. It's clear in Appalachia. It's clear in the African-American, part of the African-American community. It's clear around the world. Uh, If you do not have father to son, father to son, father to son, you do not have a functioning society. Uh, verse 4 is building a tower whose top reaches to the heaven ancient jewish wisdom says a key part of the tower of babel philosophy that we call progressivism socialism communism it's all the same thing uh, is a war against god that's verse 4 verse 6 
God said, look, the people, they all have this one language and they're, they're too unified. This isn't good for society. So uh, the languages change, different cultures emerge, and, um, and to this day, the most successful society in the last 2,000 years, the United States of America, was built on the idea of separate states, limiting the power of the federal government, using the Constitution to make it possible for different states to do different things. Admittedly, it's all one language, it's one country, but each state can do its own thing and that way people can learn of different approaches what works well what doesn't work well and so on and so forth so that is the um, the origin of socialism and when i speak about a coherent pattern of socialism uh, it all emerges from a careful study of the original hebrew of those first nine verses of chapter 11 in Genesis. Rather remarkable. And uh, it's not a surprise that it is a perfect, coherent, comprehensive attack on the five Fs. But I will explain. First of all, how is socialism opposed to the first F of family. And by the way, somebody wrote to me, you know, and I love getting mail from you. I don't think I've answered him yet. I intend to do so as soon as I have an opportunity, or as soon as I make an opportunity, I should say. I don't want to be passive about it. But one of his questions was, what is the sequence of these five? Well, if you go to rabbidaniellappin.com, and you download yourself a free ebook called The Holistic You, you will see a diagram in that free ebook that you will get access to. And it's a diagram of a circle, and you can draw this yourself. Make five equidistance points on the circle, and there's a very neat way of doing that with nothing but a compass, by the way. And um, when you've done that, In any order, in any way you choose, just label each of those five, uh, family, fortune, friendships, fitness, and faith. Just label them. And then take a ruler and join each one of those points to each of the others, not joined to it by a direct arc. So in other words, uh, if you have family, a dot labeled family, um, you draw a line from there to all the to three of the others, not the two on either side, and uh, you will end up with a diagram of the holistic you, your five main areas that keep your life on track. And so uh, there's no particular sequence. It doesn't matter which where you start. Uh, they're they're all equally important. They all interact with one another. And so, uh, and by the way, if you haven't done this yet, just just go on the website and download your free copy of The Holistic You. Uh, If you haven't done it yet, it will give you a completely new and accurate perspective of your life. And if indeed you are also uh, starting to recognize that you are me incorporated, then uh, this is all a very good time to be taking care of all these things. And so uh, family, very important, right? Uh, That a a man and a woman marry, commit to one another and to their future children, and that they then have children. That is called family. And it's absolutely fundamental to society. You've got to have it. Every trait, characteristic, and quality of good citizenship is learned within a family. Family is a place where there's a father and a mother. Well, I don't really have to work very hard, do I, showing you that the push of progressivism and the seduction of socialism fights an incessant battle against family. I'll just give you a few instances, but I know that you will think of many more. 
One way is driving women out of the home. Now, everybody knows that men and women need one another. For Apart from all the obvious reasons, men build cities, women build homes. Can't have a home if you don't have a city, because an isolated home all by itself doesn't last. It's got to be part of a community. And so women build homes, men build cities. The city is a place where homes can exist, but cities depend on homes. Cities cannot be factories. Cities need homes. And so men and women combine to build civilization. They women build homes, men build cities. And what the popular culture does, whether it's in Germany or the United Kingdom or Canada or the United States, is they do everything possible to drive women out of the home. It doesn't make sense. It simply doesn't make sense. Because women's feminine nature and yes of course there are exceptions right everyone knows that but the percentage of exceptions is so tiny as to be negligible and i don't really know that i have to talk about it if you regard yourself as an exception god bless you so be it but overwhelmingly uh, women discover and huge numbers of women discover during the COVID year they love being home they love being home and so they ought to and men discovered they love having their wives at home how much more dedicated i can be to my job when i know that my wife is taking care of the home everything is good at home yes it's it's absolutely extraordinary uh, the whole propaganda persuading women that working for a boss in a company that is meaningful but working to build your family for your husband and for your children that's demeaning that makes you nothing but a housewife listen housewife or homemaker are highly prestigious words not in our culture but you've got to recognize that this is socialism doing everything it can to destroy the home, to destroy the family. And the surest way of doing that is getting rid of the woman. You just got to get her out. Oh, the woman must be in the workplace. Right. Yeah. If you have socialist dreams of destroying a society and rebuilding it in a socialist model, yes, you do have to get the woman out of the home. Of course you have to. It's a shocking thing because, I mean, after all, you know, how hard should it be for any woman to realize that her 20s and 30s are her best years for getting married and starting to build a family? Best years, right? You get your best shot at a man, meaning a high-quality male. You get your best shot of a high-quality male in your early 20s. You're never gonna you're never gonna have a better shot. Not I'm not saying it's impossible. I myself I know of many many women who uh, uh, who have spoken to me and we've worked through some of the difficulties of being an, an older single woman. And they've many of <coughs> have contracted beautiful marriages and thank God they're happy and all is good. But you know. Yes, I mean, George Burns smoked cigars and lived to be 100 years old. Don't count on that. And so uh, it, it's the most extraordinary thing how easily women have been indoctrinated to go against their own feminine interests. It's extraordinary. And I used to be more puzzled, but the year of COVID showed me how easily people can be indoctrinated you know, and I, I do I have to say more, the masks, right, uh, and the lockdown, and the, the fear, and the, uh, and the pettiness that arose between people as a result of all of, you know what, it's just not that hard to indoctrinate a group of people, it really isn't, particularly if like socialists, like Russia, for instance, and like China, the media are hand in hand with the government well then it's simple it really is so i'm no longer quite as baffled by how 
millions of otherwise smart young women have been indoctrinated to go against their own interests, to violate their own femininity. And every time they feel their uterus calling to them, they shout it down and sometimes they bang it on the head and they force it to keep quiet because it's sending a regressive, anti-progressive message. I'm not in this world just to pop out babies. <laughs> it's, uh, it becomes a very sad day when you discover just how important it was for you to have a few babies, and it is now too late. So uh, attacking women and forcing women to distort their reality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what socialism. And by the way, uh, Cuba, Russia, China, always everywhere, it is a very important part because the family can be a bulwark against the tyranny of a socialist dictatorship. It's within a family that people find freedom. People have sometimes said to me, why, why isn't freedom one of your Fs? Well, because freedom is the consequence of doing the five Fs. It's how you get freedom. You can't sort of do freedom, but you can do a family. You can do money. You can do friendships. And you can do faith. And you can do fitness. And all of those things together, yeah, they do produce freedom. So socialism uh, makes war on women. You just have to know that. It's a reality. Inheritance tax, that's another thing. Destroy the relationship between parents and children. And you do that by imposing as close to 100% tax as you possibly can get away with on the assets that anyone leaves behind when they move onwards to an embrace with their God. That's what you do. It's the inheritance tax. Not only does it is it another way of seizing money, on which, by the way, everyone's already paid taxes, right? The only reason you have those assets is you earn them during your life, you pay tax on it all, and now you should be able to give it to your children. No, that maintains and strengthens the relationship between parents and children. So we we take as much of that as we possibly can. Um the the teachings that um, it takes a village to raise a child. Again, it doesn't. It takes a family. It takes a mother and a father and siblings. That's how a child is raised. It doesn't take a village. No, absolutely not. Uh, expect to find in America and North America in general an increase in emphasis on children's rights because the more you can build a legalistic relationship between children and the state, the more you drive a destructive wedge between children and parents. And so um, uh, expect the way things are going. Expect that children are going to eventually, and it's not going to be long, will be given a hotline to call to report their parents for a variety of ills. That's what we can look forward to. I know some of you are saying, oh, come on. It's all right. You'll see. I'm sorry to say, I wish I, wish I was wrong. Uh, the whole idea that parents are oppressors, you will find this uh, an idea that will be growing and increasing. I should tell you back in 1960, as the British pulled out of Africa, the Russians moved in and uh, set up communist uh, governments throughout Africa. And they um, they opened a university. They didn't. They wanted to take young, promising Africans from um, Zimbabwe and Zambia and Ghana, and Nigeria and the Congo and Kenya and and and, uh, and um, Malawi and everywhere else. They wanted to take them to train them to be good progressives and good communists in Russia, but they didn't want them to be in the same universities as their children in Moscow. So they started a university particularly for Africans. It was called Patrice Lumumba University, named after one of the earliest communist uh, tyrants in the Congo, called Patrice Lumumba, who was later assassinated, um, quite probably by America. 
at any rate, uh, that university, and while I was living in Africa, I knew many people who had gone to university in Moscow at Patrice Lumumba University and had come back to Africa. Uh, the ones I spoke to were disillusioned completely. Um, the ones who came back very excited to become the new communist leaders of a new Africa, they certainly didn't talk to me. But uh, the ones who did talk to me told me one of the most extraordinary things. And I verified this. At first, you know, it, it shocked me, but I have a much clearer understanding of it today. Um, in order to rise in this hierarchy and to be sent back by Russia back to your country where they would make a role for you in government, uh, they expected you to do what? To murder a parent. You had to kill your mother or your father. Ideally, both. Yeah, that's right. Why? To show that you are shrugging off the past, you are recognizing that your parents tried to oppress you by bringing you up as a Christian, and that uh, you can free yourself of that. Now, um, sometimes when I tell people about this, they oh, come on, that's not true. Uh, yeah, it actually is true. But if it's too much for you to believe, then how about I tell you about a nice Jewish boy called Jerry Rubin? Actually, not a nice boy at all, a very, very wicked Jewish boy called Jerry Rubin, who was one of the student radicals of 1968, the Chicago Seven, uh, the people who disrupted the uh, Chicago National Convention in 68, the ones who coined the term pigs for the police, etc., etc. Uh, Jerry Rubin, one of his most famous sayings, he wrote it, he spoke it, people bought into it and believed it, and I'm now quoting Jerry Rubin directly. Until you're prepared to kill your parents, you're not really prepared to change the country because our parents are our first oppressors. So you should by now be starting to get the idea that socialism, communism, progressivism, whatever you choose to call it, liberalism, whatever you want to call it, um, is the... 180 degrees diametric opposite of biblical civilization. So the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, uh, the fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother. Therefore, socialism has to turn that on its head, invert it, and say you actually have to do the opposite of honoring your father and mother. You actually have to kill them. And that is really what is at the heart of the uh, the lefted the leftish the leftward belief in the relationship between parents and children really really important you've got to do everything possible to shatter that relationship you've you've got to do it and so um, uh, that is exactly what they did and um, and and they realized that they've got to drive women out of the home, make sure that homes fall apart, inheritance tax, uh, teach that parents are oppressors, enlarge and expand children's rights, and uh, stress the idea takes a village. And I, I've actually looked at um, two or three studies, one of them from a professor at the University of Ohio, and I forget the other two universities, but they all had the same theme, which is, you know, how society must raise children. And I checked to see, and they all, you know how you do a search, right? I checked, and all of them lacked one word, parents. Parents did not show up. Can you believe it? 28 pages on how society should raise children, and the word parent doesn't show up once. Isn't that something? And if you're interested in searching the stuff yourself, uh, you just want to look up the term adultism adultism. Adultism is um, being a tyrant to children when you don't realize that as an adult you will perpetuate the way you were raised and you'll raise your children that way and you will tyrannize them and oppress them. So uh, this is all, by the way, this is all carefully thought out. This stuff is taught at universities and uh, if you don't know about it then you just aren't aware of the frighteningly potent ammunition that the other side possesses. 
uh, as you can imagine, you know, if you're talking to an adolescent, do you have any idea of how seductive this stuff is? You know, this is the kid who want you. You didn't let take the car, and this is the kid who uh, you're disciplining, and this is the kid you're making do his homework. And now he reads or he hears his teacher telling him, telling him how parents are the original oppressors that we meet in our lives. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll say. Okay, this is all part of how the F of family is fought against by the left. Finally, the last thing is they destroy the polarity of masculine and feminine. Part of the beauty and the thrill and the ecstasy of building a family is the coming together of masculine and feminine. And the more polarity there is, the more exciting it is, right? A, a, a feminine woman wants to surrender herself, but only to an admirable, outstanding masculine man. And a man wants to be a leader to his woman, but only if she is a feminine woman. If she is struggling to bring out her masculine side because she's not going to be relegated to the insult of womanhood, you know, and, and they've all been sold on this stuff by the universities. They've been sold on it. So men and women, all part of the same thing, right? Uh, gender is no, no longer binary. Heterosexuality is not normative. Heteronormative is a disease, meaning you think that uh, normal is male and female. That's how it works. And so through all of these techniques, everything that we speak about in building your family, sustaining and strengthening your all undermined by socialist culture. Uh, fortune, the next F. It's pretty straightforward, right? You Again, you barely need me to tell you. Uh, Communist Manifesto, the uh, number one, fighting ownership of property. Uh, property should be owned by everybody, which is, of course, they never explain that that means by the state, by government. Uh, their dream is limitless taxation to make people dependent on government. And, you know, you might say, well, you know, it's crazy right now because people... Um, there are all kinds of jobs going. Nobody wants to work. Why? Because the government's giving them money. That's right. That's not an accident. It's not, how could they be so stupid to pay so much money to people during the COVID crisis that it doesn't pay them to go back to, how can they be so stupid? They're not being stupid at all. They're being brilliant. You don't know what their playbook is, but as soon as you understand that the playbook of socialism is to deprive you of your financial independence, and to make you increasingly dependent upon the state, then you will realize just how brilliant the government has been. Um, rising license fees. You know, I, if you are somebody who, for your profession, has to take out an annual license, you'll notice what's happened to the fees for everything from being a dentist to being a hairstylist. Fees have shot up meteorically over the last 10 years. As America has moved along this frightening path of socialism, license fees just another way of taxing people, right? Just another way of making it harder for you to make your own living. Um, undermining employment with a minimum wage. Yeah, that's right. That's the whole idea. You think they really care about low-income people? If they did, they, they, would, they would not interfere in the private negotiations between employer and employee. But as soon as you say to the employer, employer, you may not pay less than $15, the employer says, well, I'll go another route. And um, there is a very interesting guy. His name's Ed Rensel. Uh, Ed is the retired president and CEO of McDonald's USA. Uh, his entire professional career was spent with McDonald's. He started as a grill cook in Columbus, Ohio in 1966, and he rose to be CEO of McDonald's. He now points out that McDonald's has begun a process of switching to automated order takering, order, order taking. You know why? Because they cannot afford to pay $15 an hour to somebody who says, would you like fries with that? 
So now it's all automated. And you've probably already been to a McDonald's that takes your order automatic, uh, electronically. If not, you will very soon. The process is well underway and it's being rolled out to every McDonald's. That's right. So there are fewer people are now going to get a start. McDonald University is, is what it, it should be called. McDonald's was a wonderful way to start life. Get a job there. You did, they would teach you. They would train you. You'd, you'd learn hard and soft skills, and there was opportunity for promotion. Well, guess what? The government has effectively kicked out the, the lowest rung of the ladder. You can't start there anymore. doesn't work that way. Um, so that, that is, uh, that's how it works. Um, another advantage of keeping women out of the home and in the workplace is it raises the tax bracket for that family, right? Another way of, another way of taxing because a progressive, another way of saying socialist, progressive taxes mean that the more you earn, the higher the proportion you pay. It's wrong. It shouldn't be that way. But again, if my goal is to build a socialist government dictatorship, then, yeah, of course, I want a progressive tax. And I want to get women working as well. So as the combined income of a family is now higher than when the man alone was working, and that's going to push them into a higher tax bracket. Applause. Fantastic. It's exactly what we want to achieve, of course. Women are being played. Just played. It's embarrassing. So, um, yeah, so they attack family. They attack fortune. Um, they attack friendships. How do they attack friendships? Well, here I have to explain something really important, which is that there are two patterns, there are two models for a human society. One of them looks like a brain. It's a myriad neuron collect connections. You, you can't even possibly draw it out. There are so many different connections from so many different points to so many other different points. That's one kind of way of structuring a society where people connect with other people at the at the at the at a music event or at their PTA or at the boy scouts or through uh, uh, over the backyard fence or uh, you connect with people through work through through mutual interest through hobby clubs dance clubs all kinds of things uh, or you can arrange society hub hub and spoke where the government is the hub at the center and every citizen relates chiefly to the government. Their relationships with other citizens are fraught with suspicion and fear. That's how it used to be in the old Soviet Union, right? Because you, you didn't know who you could trust. And so all your interactions were with the government. You want medical help? Go to the government. You want your pension? Go to the government. You want uh, a job? Go to the government. It's anything that government is your first and only recourse. You don't, you don't turn to other people. And so a friendship, social connection between people is effectively and deliberately undermined by socialism. That's what's done. Again, taking women out of the home destroys that as well. Because as anybody knows, uh, in a married couple, the onus of retaining connections almost always is shouldered by the woman, that burden whether it's birthday cards or Christmas cards or Thanksgiving arrangements. If the women didn't talk to the women, none of these things would happen. And neighborhoods where women are home are living neighborhoods, and they're a delight to drive through. Neighbors talk to neighbors over the back fence, and the park has moms and, and kids, and the moms are talking to each other and making plans and, and making connections. Neighborhoods where all the women are professional women, they're all at work. Neighborhoods where all the women have been played. Uh, those are lonely, sterile, quiet neighborhoods with no connection and no communication going on. And so um, friendship is profoundly undermined by what is being done to persuade women to bail out. Um, the IRS attacking organizations, fellowships. Right. As a matter of fact, Lois Lerner was the name of a woman who was the head of the IRS in 2013 during the Obama administration. Um, she uh, managed to use the IRS um, to attack 
conservative organizations, Tea Party organizations, religious organizations. Uh, all of a sudden, conservative organizations didn't get their nonprofit status, they didn't get uh, tax exempt, nothing. Lois Lerner was investigated by the Department of Justice and the FBI, and uh, finally in 2015, I quote, they found substantial evidence of mismanagement, poor judgment, and institutional inertia, but um, they decided not to proceed with a criminal prosecution. Well, of course, it was an Obama Justice Department, but it was perfectly clear that the IRS was being used to destroy the friendship side of American society. It's very sad, but that is what was happening. And so, yes, uh, what happens is that family is attacked, fortune is attacked, friendships are attacked, faith, right? You hardly, you hardly need to know any more about uh, than the government hostility to faith, right? Um, riots could happen during COVID, no problem. Uh, liquor stores could be open, alcohol stores open, no problem. Churches, oh no, we've got to close the churches. Banishing of Christianity from public schools. The whole idea that religion is offensive, you must keep it quiet. You mustn't say Merry Christmas, you must say Happy Holidays. All of this driven by a socialistic conviction that uh, the Judeo-Christian thinking is the enemy of socialism. Well, they're absolutely right, of course it is. These are the opposite sides of the same coin. You can't have it both. Either it is a Judeo-Christian Bible-based society which happens also to push for a free market, or alternatively, it's a socialistic, progressive, left-wing, liberal society. can't be both. And uh, you're either for faith or hostile to faith. That's how it goes. And so, uh, um, and then finally, fitness. And fitness is the only one that have, is a question mark, and that's I alluded to briefly earlier. The reason is because, think about this, um, doesn't a farmer want to keep his livestock as healthy as he possibly can? Sure, because if his livestock gets sick or dies, they stop delivering milk or wool or whatever else they do for him. So, of course, he wants his livestock to be healthy. Well, once you realize that government views population as its slaves, as its belonging, then it makes perfect sense that they want to keep the population healthy. We're, we're government's livestock. And since government pays for our medicine, ultimately just the way the farmer pays for his cow's medications, they want to minimize the cost of medication. And so government is very big on health. Smoking is the best example. Um, our smoking uh, culture, our anti-smoking culture is actually no more harsh than Hitler's Nazi party's smoking policy, because national socialists, right? The Nazis were national socialists. They actually viewed all of German citizens as belonging to the Fuhrer, belonging to Hitler, and therefore they must be kept healthy. And so uh, this is why the fitness one is not under constant and direct attack by the, uh, by the culture as fortune, faith, family and friendship are constantly under horrifyingly potent and uh, terrifying attack, uh, which is why when people say to me, so what can I do to push back? How can I play a part in trying to salvage the America that once was? How can I play a role in protecting the Constitution and somehow keeping alive the country that the founders envisioned. The answer is very simple. Don't go out to displays, don't go out to protests, don't go out to demonstrations. All of that is childish and, and achieves nothing at all because you're not willing to engage in violence like the other side is. Uh, rather, devote your energies to your five Fs. Go to my website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and make sure you get your free ebook, The Holistic You. The Holistic You. That's a good place to get going. Make sure that uh, you embark on a program to switch some of your entertainment time into time to learn how to do financial statements and uh, 
above all, you want to use your father's 20 discount, F-A-T-H-E-R-S, T two zero father's 20 discount for a an online course called financial prosperity course and you'll find that again you go to rabbidaniellappin.com look for online courses and you will find it make sure to use the discount code and you will be in good shape so that my friends brings us about as far as we can go this time on today's rabbi daniel lappin show uh, do let me know how things are going. And by the way, if they're new little uh, happy warriors being born, uh, they have my profound and heartfelt blessings, and you have my congratulations. Do let me know about it. I really get pleasure knowing that uh, there are new little happy warriors being raised and growing up to add to our ranks. Uh, that is about as far as we go. Your rabbi, that's me. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lapp, and thanks for being part of the show. Thank you for spreading the word on the show. Uh, I, we're big on, on Apple iTunes. We're very big on iTunes. I just discovered some numbers this last week. It's fabulous. So thanks very much indeed. Uh, we're also growing very strongly in India and in Africa, uh, also in the United Kingdom. All of that due to your efforts, I know, in letting people know about it. So that's how it works. I mean, the, in these days of social media and connection and communication, uh, people won't find things unless somebody they know and like and trust recommends it. So that's your role. Appreciate that. I want to wish you a week of good times and growth in your five Fs, your family, your faith, your finances your friendships, and your physical fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.